I've seen over my 20 some years of practice, I've seen the drug um, culture change a lot. You know, we went through a period where it was cocaine and crack and meth and, and then pills. And in the last several years, heroin has been the big problem. effort here at the news hour that we're calling America Addicted. Opioids are now the biggest drug epidemic in American history. A dozen people are in jail after a major drug bust in West Virginia. Police New policy detaining. change for Huntington first responders has left some residents concerned. The overdose problem in Huntington is nothing new, but there's still no set answer on how to fix it. West Virginia, it has the highest death rate from drug overdoses in the country. see a lot of people in active addiction. You can just tell uh, it's, it's, a, it's a lot worse than where I'm from. I thought where, where I was from was bad until I got here and, you know, seen some of the things going on around here. And you can just tell who's, um, who's out there and who's not. I don't know, I recognize it from being back home and being in active addiction myself. So growing up, I mean, uh, Huntington, I'm a little partial, I'm a little bit biased. Uh, Huntington is a, a wonderful place, especially a great place to raise a family and those types of things. Uh, however, I, I've seen it all. Uh, and I will also tell you that, uh, that from my perspective, it's not really a, a drug uh, epidemic. It's sort of a, a resurgence. Uh, jobs leave. Yeah, there was a great industry when I came here in the 80s. Uh, it already started falling off by then, but certainly in, in the 10 years after I got here, uh, industry had pretty much left. When I came to Marshall University, I didn't have a vehicle and I'd walk from campus to downtown with my friends to go out to eat or wherever and felt perfectly safe. Um, I don't feel that way anymore. Uh, I think that's changed. A lot of people don't feel safe walking around in certain sections of Huntington, walking several blocks in Huntington like they used to. Um, we knew we had such a bad problem here several years ago, we were all gonna have to come together, that it was gonna take the whole city, the whole government and the whole church in one to come together. Everybody's gonna have to be a part of this. And I think that's why we're winning. I'll keep saying it, they can keep saying how bad it is, and I'm telling you, we are winning. Point When I first started working uh, in addiction medicine, or nine to 10 years ago, you know, every patient that came in was using Oxycontin, which is a long, uh, long acting formulation of uh, oxycodone. Uh, and then sort of over time can see where they move from the Oxycontin. And then when they got taken off the market and then there was a small sort of increase in oxymorphone, uh, which is a, a different, similar, but different manufacturer than, than Oxycot Oxycontin was. Uh, and then it got taken off the market and then you saw a, a sudden surge of in roxycodone, which is a short acting uh, formulation of oxycodone. Uh, and then when that sort of started to become less uh, scarce and, and less prescribed, uh, and a lot of that had to do with government regulations, uh, then you started to see more heroin. Yeah, this, is, this is a spot where um, I used to come about four years ago, three or four years ago, and it brings back a lot of a lot of old memories. Um, as you can see, it's it's on the other side of the river from Huntington, but it but it amplifies the idea that the things that happen in Huntington 
kind of have a ripple effect um, across our tri-state area. Um, I come here a lot for for heroin and, and oxycotton, and I um, there was a kids here. It's one of the things that I regret is is causing any situation to be any more difficult on children, and, and that's why I've kind of wanted to make the city a better place and um, do things to to help the people that suffer from substance use disorder. Oh, they tore it down. Holy crap. Wow. That's... I remember printing out at work two sides of a $20 bill and taping them and gluing them together and bringing them up here. And we got about 15 um, Roxy 30s from the guy and spent about a month trying to rectify that. Couldn't believe it worked. But we pulled some we pulled some shady things and to get did whatever we had to do to get drugs. From his early, early days, he uh, wasn't afraid of anything. Yeah, I didn't realize what that could lead us to. Craig never, never was afraid. As a, as a six-year-old, in the, in the end of a soccer game that was tied, and several of the kids had played uh, goalie, they needed somebody to be in the goal for the shootout, and he's the only one that raised his hand. Um, so he's just all, just no fear. It probably has backfired in some instances, but he's not afraid to try anything. Gosh, I met Craig when he was about nine. I had known of Craig through the, you know, through through the youth soccer program. Real didn't realize when we bought our house that he just lived around the corner. So I used to watch him ride his bike and you know this kind of thing. So you know, I came from a good family. I, I grew up in Barbersville. I, um, I I enjoyed playing soccer. I had success in sports. My my family were very very good people. Uh, people will tell you. A lot of addicts and alcoholics will tell you that they just they just didn't feel like they fit in, and, and that wasn't the case for me. Like I, I, um, I, I, I really enjoyed fitting in. Like I wanted to be the life of the party, and I wanted everybody to like me. And I drank quite a bit in high school, uh, my junior and senior year, and um, I went on to play soccer for Marshall University. And I, I tore my ACL my senior year, um, my next to last game my senior year, and they put me on pain medications. And I, I had never really heard of any dangers associated with them at that point in 2000, what, 2003 or 2004. And um, I, I really liked the way it made me feel. Like, I, I'm like, where has this been all my life? And from there, it just graduated because I could not put it down. I, you know, I, I, I went and, I went and, uh, to the foot doctor and made a bunch of claims that my feet were bothering me and they'd give me lower tabs. And, um, so, because at, at that time it wasn't really a big fear um, and it wasn't as widespread of a problem at that time uh, or a known widespread problem anyways. And um, <clears throat> so I, I, I got hooked from lower taps to, to Oxycontin to heroin for another 13 years. So. And what I realized about Craig was that he is exactly who he says he is. He is very transparent and his transparency is what really is working for him in the recovery world. He's truly the example and the epitome of transformation. And what God has downloaded into this man is is what he's about to do here with Hawk. You can see right now he's a major go-getter. He's major, gonna make great things happen. And to have uh, the, the uh, tragic situations that maybe took place. And we, around here in our vernacular, would say that the enemy was trying to take him out. You know, you, I mean, really, the, the enemy of his destiny would really love to have pushed him to the side and marginalized his gifts and set him on the side of the road where he's just a spectator and watching the world go by. But as you can see, God had other plans and I'm so glad we met him and met him here at this church and watched what God's doing in his life has been phenomenal. It's, it's taken a lot of courage and, um, and faith to have undertaken this venture. And, and what better, what, what better way to convey a message than somebody that says, I, was, I walked your walk, I've been in your shoes. This is what I did, and I think if you let me, I can take you to where you want to go. I mean, yeah, it's, it takes somebody that's fearless to do what he's trying to do. 
I was directing the Lifehouse for for about a year, and I and I knew that I've had I was having some success getting through to people and and getting them to understand that there was a better way of life, and and in that process, I just knew that I wanted to do it on a bigger scale, and I just didn't know how I was going to do it. And um, you know, one one evening after a situation occurred in my life. Um, I got down on my knees and I said, God, you need to tell me whether I should stay where my purpose and passion is and helping other people or go provide for my kids because I'm not making enough money right now to do both. And, and the very next morning I woke up and, um, and, and this concept hit my mind. And uh, my first thought was, why is nobody doing all this, doing this in its totality? And, um, and, this, and then my second thought was like, oh, I, I hear you. I hear you. I, and ever since then, every penny that I've needed to to, to make it happen, every meeting that I've needed, um, has has come with with very little barriers. Yeah, one of the um, one of the biggest things that we see is that's an encouragement to others is when one of your fellow people in drug court, because it's almost like a boot camp. There's a sense of family that that. Um, comes out of out of drug court and when somebody succeeds and they graduate we have a big ceremony for them we make a big deal out of it the press is usually here we have food it's a big party um, when when they graduate they give a speech at the front of the room what was unique about that experience um, was while they were speaking and talking about how they've gone through this long process and how they're now raising their kids again they're working again they're they are feeling great about themselves what's neat about that is this courtroom was packed. There was standing room only. And some of the people that were in the courtroom were in week one, phase one. And so when you talk about a domino effect, I think that's kind of where you see it. You see people who are really successful and it does, it filters down to the people through the different phases. And so our concept is, is fairly simple. You know, my original vision was that uh, we would become a resource for the current recovery landscape. Most. Uh, most in particular, the recovery houses in the community um, that, uh, that already do a very nice job uh, in rehabilitating active um, addicts and alcoholics that suffer from substance use disorder. Setbacks happen in, in the recovery process. Um, relapses happen. And when, when an event occurs, we, we wanted um, to be a resource for those houses to be able to utilize um, so that they didn't have to be faced with a decision to keep them in the house or discharge them to the street left to their own devices. So we would bring them in for an undetermined period of time because it's case specific. Um, and then we would hand deliver them on a, after a satisfactory assessment, we would hand deliver them back to the program that they came from. Those people that come literally come off the street that have no affiliation to any house, to any program, they're literally getting into recovery for the first time or back into recovery. Um, we would bring them in um, for a stabilization period. Uh, we had identified their needs, their wants, their desires, their drug history, their recovery history. Most importantly, what are they willing to do? Because for the successful consummation of anything at all in life, there has to be a certain degree of willingness in pursuit of it. So uh, we would figure out, we would take into consideration some, consideration some of their input um, on what their recovery should look like. Um, now, all the, all the eggs will not be in, in their input basket, um, so to speak, but with some clinical advice, um, some advice from people that have experience in recovery, and from some uh, input from the client, we would come up with a treatment plan for those individuals, um, each, in, each person individually. And um, based on what we feel, what the client's willing to do, uh, we would dispatch them to a program after a period of stabilization uh, to the place that we feel gives them the best opportunity for permanent long-term sobriety or an improved quality of life through medication-assisted treatment. Because what's, what's really happening right now is that when, when an addict or an alcoholic is looking for, for treatment, it's 85% of the time, in my opinion, it's, it's because one of two reasons. Either law enforcement is saying, you need to get a recovery bed or you're going to jail, mm -hmm. or family members are saying, you need to get a recovery bed or we're done with you. So what this the addict or alcoholic does is they pick up the phone and they essentially take what they can get. Whatever bed's available, they take it. They don't know anything about the program. They don't know anything about what's gonna be required when they get there, what kind of process it is. They're just trying to satisfy these two entities of people, one of these two entities of people, or sometimes both. So what we think is gonna improve, strengthen, and support what currently exists is if we bring them in, um, figure out what the best pathway is for them, and then get them to that, uh, to that particular uh, pathway of recovery. And even further from that, uh, we're gonna figure out 
uh, what gets gets people out of bed in the morning and put their feet on the floor without hitting the snooze button, like I like to say a lot. What is their true purpose and passion? I've had some things happen to me over the last couple of years that are um, that normally I would um, go drink or drug because that's that's what I do whenever I feel a certain way. I I revert back to my to my default actions, which is getting high and, and using drugs and. In this last year and a half, um, I, I've, I've figured out my purpose and passion in helping other people and never felt like getting high and never hit the snooze button uh, because I was excited to get out of work, go, you know, get out of bed, go to work and, and do things um, that uh, really held my interest. And uh, we want to figure that out for every individual person. Um, it's very similar to the to the argument that Bruce Alexander makes in the Rat Park study, um, that we need to get people connected into their social life, into their spiritual life, and, and into their uh, recovery network. Um, it's, a, it's a totality approach rather than just a cookie cutter one. Um, statistically, nearly 45% of the people who come through programs or who are in active addiction don't have a, a diploma. And so, you know, Craig said that he didn't just want to help people get sober, he wanted people to have enriched lives, you know, careers, goals. And part of that is evening the playing field with everyone else. And so um, he asked me to put together a plan, a proposal of sorts, of how we could offer the recovery community a chance to um, take their task. It was previously called the GED, the high school equivalency, um, and how to uh, allow them to take their task and use this as a resource, use the Hawk as a resource. And so primarily my job at Hawk is to facilitate and teach um, classes five days a week that is open to the recovery community, but also the community in general. This is the Huntington Addiction Wellness Center. Um, this is gonna be our, our clinical area of our facility. Um, well, everybody that comes into our facility will have a primary care physician starting day one. Um, and here we've got our, our lab, infectious disease, HIV, hepatitis C, um, testing. This is our exam room. Got a urinalysis pass-through window. This is our group counseling room. Um, to kind of amplify our neutrality, we've got shirts from a lot of the programs in town. We've still got a few more to, to acquire. The big programs and, and a few of the houses are here. We will be um, ADA compliant, Americans with Disabilities app. We've got um, the handicap bathroom. This is my office. We've got the handicap bedroom on the first floor. Something we're, we're going to do a little differently than, than everybody else in the, in the community is that we do have a rec dorm. We've got a ping pong table, ping pong table, 50 inch TV. Uh, I think it's important um, that we have this and it's a little different because um, we want to give uh, the clients a space to be able to relax uh, for one and, and keep their mind off of the life they just left. Um, if we can keep them stimulated and engaged in something, it's it's less likely that they're gonna they're gonna depart because they they want to get high or or they're left to their own, own thoughts and 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 programs that don't let them turn the TV on until four or five o'clock. We we want to keep them engaged and stimulated um, so that we have a better chance to to keep them engaged um, and off the mind about the life that that they just left. Um, this is our dining area. Um, it's where the clients will eat and, and also spend time. We'll also have some, um, some abstinence-based groups in here uh, for the clients. Um, this is kind of a, this is about 300 people total. There's 125, 125 names, but there's a bunch of groups on here. So there's about 300 people total that have, that have really, uh, in some form or fashion, um, contributed to the effort of the making of the Huntington Addiction Wellness Center. It just shows the support um, of the people and businesses of this community. This is our, we've got donated a smart board. It's going to give us the ability to teach and, and a little more interactively and uh, just a little bit different spin to keep keep the clients engaged. I'm going to take you upstairs to the to the dorms. 
some men's bathroom. So a lot of these, all of these beds have been donated. You'll see that um, above the bed are, are the people that donate them and then they wanted them in dedication of somebody. Um, every bed was, was donated by members of this community. We've had beds come from Jacksonville, Florida, um, Lexington, Kentucky, Louisville. So there's been a lot of support um, all over the East Coast for, for the Huntington Addiction Wellness Center. Um, there'll be three in that dorm, there'll be five in this dorm. Yeah, and all these beds have been donated. And ten, ten in this dorm. And all these beds have also been donated. So this will be a, a supervisor office. Um, so this floor is the case management and peer support floor. Um, you have two, two supervisors, you got four case managers and or peer support specialists um, in this office. And two more in here. We recognize the importance of, of having an environment um, that is motivational. So our you know, kind of our decor is is um, is motivational because we want to keep in the minds that, that people can do this and, and keep championing championing these people to to continue to pursue a, a better life. What happens when when people need a job and they have a background? But what he's done with Hawk Designs is he's allowed a workforce of people that have come through the recovery community and they have the drive, they have the ability. Um, and basically what Hawk Designs is, is a construction, uh, remodeling, you know, any kind of work like that that you can imagine. And, and it's the very people who couldn't maybe get a job somewhere else. And the beauty of it isn't just that they can work at Hawk Designs, but after a year or two, what company wouldn't hire someone, background notwithstanding, who's done incredibly well and now has the references that they didn't have before. You know, now has companies that saw them work. You know, private homeowners who said, he was in my home and, and, and he did wonderfully and he was incredibly polite and I would have him back. And so Craig has really, again, and it's a gift of his to see a problem and immediately envision the solution and then execute it. Lo and behold, all the ones that are successful the, the, the person that's going through the recovery winds up working in a recovery center trying to teach other people, you know, and, and that's the only way it's really gonna work. You get the Craigs of the world, you know, that, that have lived it, luckily have, have beat it, you know, that are now able to tell their story to everybody else. And you're right, it is a domino effect. Craig's the fifth of Lifehouse graduates who now have recovery homes and places for recovery in this city from just Lifehouse. And that's not including all the other people who have changed their life, have jobs, do well, own businesses, have rebuilt their family and relationship with the rest. So yes, the domino effect's amazing. Cause like it says for every one person that's struggling with addiction, there are seven people who are affected. So if that one person gets better, not only are them seven better, they multiply them seven with whoever they connect in touch with. And so yeah, the domino effect is huge. I heard a story when I first got into early recovery about, and, and it's a, it's a fairly, uh, well-known story, but it's a gentleman who falls into a hole and he asks his, his friend, you know, can you go get someone to help? And his friend jumps in the hole with him and he says, what are you doing now? We're both stuck. And his friend says, I've been here before. I know the way out. And, and in a nutshell, that's, that's the domino effect. You know, we've spent so long with this profound sense of hopelessness. There is no way out. Um, you know, we'll be slaves to drugs and alcohol for the rest of our lives that when we finally get shown by someone that there is a way out, that it's attainable, you can't help but want to give that to every person you meet because the, the feelings are fresh. You know, I've, I'm coming up on 19 months clean on the 22nd and I can still remember the hopelessness. And so when I look and see someone who's coming in and they're a day or two clean, you know, just coming off of drugs and alcohol, I think I'm going to show it. You know, I, I can help him and then he's gonna help someone. And the idea is that it's a ripple effect, right? 
you know, you start out with five people who get clean and five or 10 years from now, there are thousands who have been impacted. It's the exact antithesis of the drug problem. Thank you.